Welcome to the Kino Yoga Podcast, bringing you the stories of many people who in various ways are attempting to walk the path of yoga. Our intention is to inspire your own practice and commitment to yoga beyond the mat and in all areas of life. We consider this an offering, a service to the community and labour of love. If you feel inclined, any donations are appreciated, just visit our page and click the donate button at www.keenonyoga.co.uk forward slash podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Today's guest on the Kiran Yoga podcast is Wambui Nujiguna Raisinam. I hope that's how we say it. She was born in Kenya to an English mother and a Kenyan father, and she grew up in the US. She started a daily yoga practice, Ashtanga Yoga, in 2008, having been taught by her mother since she was young. But she started in 2008 in Abu Dhabi whilst a teacher of English. She is particularly interested in creating soft spaces for the teaching of yoga to take place specifically trauma-informed and inclusive of often marginalised voices, so welcoming spaces for all. In this podcast, we both share our experiences on such topics as inclusion, patriarchy, cultural appropriation, trying to flesh out the meaning and feeling behind the use of these terms that are often banded around a little bit. Because more than ever before, we have the opportunity towards equality and inclusion here now. The question is, in understanding the territory and our conditioned ways of thinking, and then having the courage of our convictions to speak out and challenge received assumptions. And challenging received assumptions is something that makes Wambui a leading example and inspiration in this field. So I'm really pleased and honoured to have Wambui here today on the Keelan Yoga Podcast. Welcome, Wambui. Thank you, Adam. Nice to be here. Great to have you at last. Um, yes. So... Just as normal, just give us a little uh, rundown of your background um, and how you got into Ashtanga in a couple of minutes. So, yeah, I'm Wambui. Uh, as we were talking before, I'm Kenyan-American. So I was born in Kenya and uh, moved to the U.S. as a child and finished growing up there. And then um, I was working in Abu Dhabi which is where I started Ashtanga Yoga. So this was in my sort of mid, mid twenties. Um, but yoga I did like first, first time ever doing yoga was when I was 15 and I was actually at a, uh, very sort of prestigious, um, competitive professional, uh, boarding school for performing arts. I was studying dance and I had lots of stress fractures and injuries and just wasn't getting on there. And I saw an advertisement for a Hatha yoga class and I was like, this sounds good. So I remember going and doing yoga there and loving it. It was just such a different way to be in my body, which wasn't externally oriented, but really about just feeling what was happening and it was very different from how I was experiencing the dance training at the time. And I remember just really loving it. So I would do like little videos in my room and I just kept doing yoga uh, throughout the rest of high school and throughout college and grad school. But just sort of here and there, I would do yoga at um, my school's gyms and uh, really enjoying it. Um, and it gave me a lot of strength and helped me to sleep and, uh, gave me peace of mind. And, uh, but it wasn't until it was sort of just more on and off. And it wasn't until I was living in Abu Dhabi, um, that I came across Ashtanga yoga. And, um, as a result of that, I was able to establish a daily practice and it took sort of center stage in my life. It led me down a very different path than <laughs> the one I had been sort of told to do. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you were teaching English in Abu Dhabi 
Is that right? Yeah, I was an yeah, English yeah. teacher. So right, I had okay. my, my okay. master's in applied linguistics and teaching English as a second language. So I was I was at a teacher trainer college there in Abu Dhabi. And I, I was at a point in my life where I had felt I had sort of listened and done all the things I was supposed to do and was still right. not feeling fulfilled. I was still not feeling that life was um, enjoyable and happy. <laughs> So I, I was sort of on this soul-searching uh, quest, you would say. And so when Ashtanga Yoga came, um, it, it, it provided like, okay, this is, this, is, this is something that is worthy of further investigation. And um, What did you like about it? Because you're always already doing the Hatha Yoga. Mm. What, what attracts you particularly to the Ashtanga? I think it was it was the promise of being able to have agency over my yoga practice. Right. And and the fact that there was this sequence mm. that you would memorize and then be able to practice wherever. You could practice at home on your own, you could practice with a teacher in a group. Because before then I was always going to someone for the 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 practice right and I, I i remember like wanting to do it at home but i didn't have that structure um so i would do a few poses and then just be like i don't know what to do next i'm done so it was never something i felt i had agency over and could actually like because with ashtanga you don't really have an excuse because <laughs> you have the the sequence whichever one you're working on you have the structure and so it's really like up to you yeah whether you're gonna you're it's gonna clear. Do the practice or not yes it's, it's clear, clear what you have what you have or haven't done right it's clear it's very it's right. immediately clear yeah yeah right and right. you don't have to wake up in the morning and think like what am yeah I gonna what do, do i today? have to do yeah 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 right yeah. so it's kind of that structure is is super important and so that was what caused the the shift to uh sometimes practice to a more regular uh lifestyle right. part of my lifestyle mm, 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 mm. and obviously you've been i mean sequestering quite quite quickly onto other topics you've been to my sort you i mean you're i i know you're authorized aren't you um yes what reflections on Mysore uh, at the time and maybe today let's just to start yeah. going a little bit deeper into this yeah. so my first visit to Mysore was, was 2009 and the last trip was 2016 and so we went I went first on my own and then uh, I met Petri quite quickly and then we we continued going together every year um, except for I think 2014 when my first son uh, our first son was born. Um, I enjoyed it at the time. It was, uh, I, I, looking back, it's a tremendous privilege <laughs> to be able to take time out and to just devote to your own personal uh, studies and your own sort of like, it's, it's a tremendous privilege um, looking back. Uh, we haven't been able to go uh, back just because, you know, family life is busy and of course COVID and um, so, yeah, I'm grateful for the, the time I was able to spend there and what I was able to learn. And uh, now uh, sort of now sort of the Ashtanga practice is, is really just uh, embedded in, in family life and seven series and uh, as well using it as a you know, to sort of be a change maker for this sort of positive social change that is sort of in the in the collective unconsciousness. Yeah, yeah. And how how do you think that that, how, how are you going about that? How are you fructifying that change? Because I, I know you do a lot about using yoga for social change. Um, and it doesn't inherently have to be taken that way, right? So why should it be taken that way, first of all, perhaps? I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a personal, it's, it's kind of a, a personal, it feels like a personal, um, my personal path. It's something that I'm drawn towards. I can't really explain why. Maybe it's, maybe it's something karmic from a previous time. Maybe it's the work I need to continue to do from the work that my ancestors did in different 
obviously not in yoga circles, but in in other spheres that uh, I feel called to to continue on. Um, and that's just how the the particular my my particular path has played out for me. That's the best I can explain it because, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it feels like there's something that it has that's unfinished that needs right. to continue on yeah. through me. Okay. So what does it mean, yoga for social change? What does that mean for you and for your work? I mean, so uh, first and foremost, I'll just sort of backtrack here and say, you know, I've been in Finland now since 2010. And um, as soon as I came here, like obviously Finland is is, is very homogenous uh, society and um I noticed like, I, but, but still, even then there are folks, you know, from different parts of the world, be it oh, folks who have come to, um, to, to seek asylum. I thought they would all be Finnish, in, right? <laughs> majority, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, Helsinki now, Helsinki now 20% of the, of the home languages, like languages spoken at home, 20% is not Finnish as the native home language. So that's, that's a lot. So it, it, the demographics are changing. So whether it's folks who have come from Somalia um, uh, as refugees or to seek asylum, or other parts of the of the of the Middle East, um, or people from the African diaspora, even though it might be a, a small number, um, I still noticed. I was like, "Wow, this yoga, which has been so beneficial and transformative for me, like like." who is not able to access these spaces and why is that? Um, who gets the sort of privilege of being able to um, do these sorts of like transformative and, and tremendously beneficial uh, practices? Um, and, and I just got curious about that, like who's being left out of these healing spaces and mm. why is that? Mm -hmm. Right. And why is that? <laughs> That's a big question, Adam. Well, yeah, yeah, That's that a is big, a big question. It's a good one, though. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of it, and I, re I was just telling you that I listened to Shana's podcast because Shana and I, like, um, w we just collaborated together on a workshop. We have, we have sort of similar, our paths are sort of inter intersecting and intertwining quite nicely. I think we have... Um, I know she got trained in the same uh, trauma conscious method as I. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with obviously how yoga is represented in the West. This is a big part uh, in terms of just who is being shown, like who who is being shown doing the yoga and then folks will self-select and be like, ooh, <laughs> nobody there looks like me, so I'm going to opt out, right? So if you look at just the, the journals and the magazines and just what is popular in terms of, of the media surrounding yoga and, 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 and how it's portrayed in the West... Um, and so it's not only the person, but the portrayal as well, not only the ethnicity or, the, you know, the cultural background of the person, but also the way it's being portrayed as well. I mean, people will self-select and you'll know right away, like, ooh, like I don't fit into this box of, 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 of who this is for. Or you might go to a class and be like, ah, I was the only like, uh, <laughs> I was I was the only brown or black person in a sea of white folks and I didn't feel too comfortable because I've heard that. I've heard that. Have like, you felt I've that? Also, that was my experience when that I was your first experience. started, when I was, when I was in, like, I remember I was in Chicago in my early twenties, um, studying. And I remember like loving the yoga. I would, I love going to the yoga classes, but the atmosphere around the studios always felt a little bit like, mm, yeah, this is definitely not a space that has me in mind, but I didn't kind of mind too much because I was just there for the yoga. And once the yoga started, everything was cool. But um, it didn't really feel like a space where I would want to like kind of hang out and chat with folks in the dressing room just because it just gave off that air of like, mm. uh, 
So it, yes, yes. But, um, you know, and I, I do just want to speak to the fact that as a, as a biracial woman, even though I sort of culturally identify as, as, as black, um, as a biracial woman, I have been sort of able and with light skin privilege, right? Mm. I have been <laughs> able to maneuver my way through white spaces. Like I know how to sort of survive in them and I know how to sort of code switch and um, find my way through these spaces. But it's always been a bit of a cognitive dissonance when you go deep inside your practice and you're really like um, kind of unveiling through all these like different identities going down into your true self and then you emerge back up into this um, social construct that is not always comfortable so that's always felt like a bit of a mm. uh, jarring jarring experience mm. Mm. what is the um the code switching you talk about uh that's when you you use your language you change your language up try language to fit in with the Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. What is what is deemed respectable? What is deemed proper? Talk proper. Don't talk like that. Right. So it's it's something that is used constantly, especially in workplaces, because if you're going to sort of talk uh, in a way that is um, not deemed normative, then you're maybe seen in a way that is uh, less educated or the social desirability bias begins to kick in. So it's something that folks. Uh, uh, who hold marginalized um, identities learn to do in order to survive dominant culture. Mm, mm, mm. And how do we now expand the boundaries of, so we can include all diasporas into yoga? And how are you doing that in your work? Uh, let's make this a more collaborative thing. <laughs> Okay. Uh, because um, I feel like, you know, it, it's really like, because one thing I experienced in yoga, it's I got to drop all these identities that um, I didn't consent into, into having, right? Um, I was able to leave all that behind and, and, and go deep down into accessing my true nature and um, into accessing what it means to be a human being. Uh, and so that's sort of the promise that, that, that yoga and that yoga promises and delivers. And that's something that each one of us can touch regardless of who, what our identities are. Um, and so each one of us can, can sort of, we have that information. We have that memory because we're going down to the to the human human level in yoga. Mm. So the idea is like, uh, it's it's really like um, for me, it's been about understanding that um, I've been born into a certain identity um, with. Out my consent, I was groomed into um, uh, let's see how do I want to say it um, upholding this status quo that is very oppressive for some and benefits uh, just a very few. Um, and so how how am I going to to sit in the complexity of that? How do you sit in the complexity of that, Adam? <laughs> it's been a while since <laughs> someone threw the question a, back at me. This um, is a collaborative but, thing, right? Because, like, <laughs> your experience is very different. So. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I also um, didn't always have a feeling of fitting in in my yoga journey. But I started out, remember, you know, in the, the late 90s, when yoga wasn't a pre prevalent thing at all. And I was in the Midlands, in the middle of England, near Birmingham area. So it wasn't, you know, that there was a load of yoga around. There certainly weren't yoga studios. Yoga was done in church halls, generally by, mm. you know. I remember a, those days. Yes. Well, generally, you know, like, <laughs> let's, let's generalize here. And it was done by, a, you know, a, a, probably an older lady, right? And so it was me 
and you know kind of 40s 50s 60 year old ladies and um, you know so and there was me right and uh and that you know was also a strange experience and yeah i i felt un- uncomfortable and to a certain degree so you know i can understand how and also you know i come from a background where you know where i came from in essex slightly outside mm-hmm. london it's uh you know this is not something you go home and tell people you do you know mm. right so mm. you know all my friends and all the background that i had and you know even well, i say in my family certain aspects of family just yeah. just would not understand what i was doing um and but yet as mm. you mentioned at the start there was this experience and i think as you rightly pointed out there's this experience when you do the yoga and it's strange to talk about it now together because it seems so normal to us but it is so revelationary yeah. and it's so obvious mm-hmm. like you're just doing something with an internal focus. So it's moving and doing, you know, because you were dancing, I was doing martial arts. You know, so there was already mm-hmm. a consciousness of the body. But yet something has changed so fundamentally when you do the asana on the mat because the focus is different. It's just revelation. Absolutely. It's revelation. It um, but I suppose latterly I started feeling, I'm not sure whether this is tangential now or on the same point, in that, there was a certain aspect of, I feel, of control around the way that the series is presented and the way that we were encouraged to do it. And, you know, coming from a background where I've already felt that I didn't fit in and I would, you know, and, you know, look, there's a very few percentage of people from where I came from that went to university, for example, right? Like, I mm, already yeah. felt I was already, uh, my antennae eyes were out for being controlled, for being, uh, you know, um, put into a certain box and um, I suppose latterly I've come to feel that the although I love the Ashtanga style there's elements of prescriptionism and rigidity in there and a narrative that could be taken as uh, slightly controlling which I don't know whether you would resonate with at all or yeah you know, th- that's no, my thank little, you that's for sharing little thank you for sharing a little bit your background and and uh uh, no, I was glad, like, because even just showing, like, the fact that here you were, this uh, young man going into these church halls and it's surrounded by these older women. I mean, it it, it's, it speaks to the fact that... Yeah, and it's, super <laughs> easy to, and it's super easy to make judgments about everyone and we all do it, right? And people will see me as a right. guy and think, well, he's had this privileged experience and that privilege. But, you know, that's a judgment again, isn't it? Again, towards, you know... I've had it in a and certain way. It yeah. speaks to the importance of getting into the nuance and the specificities of people's experiences. And this is something that can get lost when you're not in conversation with folks. So um, this is a, a, a really important point, especially when we're talking about this work, when we're using our spaces for social change. It's really like getting to know like the, 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 the details and the nitty gritty mm. of people mm. So we're not coming with our assumptions and our judgments and our biases, like because you look a certain way or because you're this kind of person, you oh, must yeah. be. This, or even act, you know or what even, act, even acting a certain way, you know, you're even. Oh, the person right. seems fine, and I can, you know, I can push them, or I can be like this or like that. And right. you don't know, you right. just don't know what's going on inside, and you never know how much stuff people have been through and how much trauma they've been Absolutely. through. I mean, you know, just to finally, you know, finish my sharing since you opened the the watershed the gates to that is that I came to do yoga with those old, old ladies in their church because mm-hmm. I was desperate, you know, because mm-hmm. I was desperate. I, I was depressed. I was, I'd been given antidepressants. I didn't want to take them. Um, I just felt, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking them, but I really felt like I, I could, yeah. I, I wanted to try something else. Um, and, you know, and I went and I, I stepped on the train for 40 minutes and at least a couple of days a week, you know, and I went up there to do those, you know, and because I was, you know, I was, I was desperate for for, mm. uh, for healing mm. myself, you know. But you know, from the outside, people would have seen this yeah. fit, relatively good-looking white guy. Very, you know, just, mm-hmm. you know, you never know, do you? That's the thing, you mm. know, what's mm. going on inside people or what they're feeling. And so, I think the Ashtanga Absolutely. can easily be, it can easily be a ra- rather kind of abrasive kind of uh, formatted, depending on how it's taken. It can be rather mm. abrasive, formatted for the individual, which is a shame because, as you say, there's some incredible aspects to it: the structure, the autonomy you have, the the sequence, the breath, the breath, and right. the sequence, which are fantastic. And yet, there's this yeah. certain kind of 
thing around it which I think you know can put people off and marginalize and exclude people that maybe really yeah. need it you know yeah no I'm glad you you, you spoke to that um, because it, it it sort of speaks to when I actually first started Ashtanga like I, I actually didn't it didn't I didn't vibe with it right away like it wasn't love at first sun salutation because I was like wait because most of my yoga experiences had been slower and a little more gentle and a little bit more like you know just the sort of ubiquitous term hatha uh and I, I here I came and it was uh led class and I was like whoa this reminds me of my dance days and so that was triggering like um in a way like I have to perform and I have to it has to look like this and so in the beginning I was like oh this oh no I, I don't want more of this um, but similar to you, I was at a time in my life where I was desperate to, and I needed tools in order to, to survive the workings of my mind, right? And so uh, there was enough, I think there was enough um, uh, work being done internally, even with the physical stuff and all my like memories of being a dancer and not being good enough to perform and all these poses are hard and this kind of thing. There was enough of the internal uh, uh, touching of peace um, in the practice that I was like, come on, one boy, like this is this is something that is 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 maybe challenging, um, but you really have nothing else right now, <laughs> so just <laughs> yeah. stick with, just just stick with it, just mm -hmm. stick with it. Like what what do you have to lose? Um, and you know, speaking to the to the to the dynamism of the practice, I mean. And this was something I really enjoyed listening to you and, and Shana's podcast um, is the fact that like I, I needed uh, discipline and consistency and a little bit of, of, of like hard tapas mm. so that I could transmute some of my habitual ways of being and habitual ways of, of, of reacting to my own mind and, and just like uh, unproductive, unhealthy lifestyles, right? Um, I needed that that sort of incubation period of 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 daily practice and like really like you you I, I need this. Uh, however, I agree that there's a lot of rigidity and this like prescription to the practice, which speaks to the shadow side when something is structured and when something seems very linear and very sequential and very progressive in just one way, which is up, 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 right? So that just sort of speaks to the shadow side of when things have this structure. Um, Having said that, you know, having my children, my two kids and needing to, to shift my practice during the pregnancies, during uh, busy, busy family life, there's so much flexibility in the practice. And it really is just up to the imagination and the, the, the agency of each practitioner to be able to, to sort of work with the, the practice and the sequence in a way that, that, that makes sense to what you need in each different aspect of your life. So my practice these days, it, it's a different motivation. It's a different purpose than when I started, you know, 12 years ago. Um, there's less uh, feeling of needing to accomplish certain asana. There's less feeling of needing to finish certain sequence. Um, it's 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 some days I need to just do some sun salutations and some standing in order to be able to sit and meditate. Other days it'll be a bit more dynamic, uh, but it's really just like now that I've removed the pressure of like needing to maintain a certain physical level. Right. Ah, there's just a little bit more space to breathe and a little bit more uh, space to just be with with what is. Because um, I know if I tried to to do what to practice um, in a way that wasn't in harmony with family life, it would be miserable for myself and yeah. my family yeah. members. <laughs> so, and that's not really the the, the purpose, I, I don't think, of like <laughs> seventh series, right? What's called the seventh series, so. Yeah, I mean, I think it has to be helpful for the individual. Otherwise, you're just doing the practice for what ends, for, for the sake of yoga. I mean, as surely you're meant to be using yoga to spread it out and make life, you know, more productive, mm -hmm. enjoyable, you know, useful for not only oneself, but for others. 
Well, you said originally about, yeah, needing that tapas. So I have to qualify what I said because it is true. And I think, you know, what did pull me through in the end, although I remember coming to the Ashtanga like you. And um, first of all, I refused to do the vinyasas. It was my girlfriend at the time who said, well, you know, I was doing uh, this Hatha yoga. She said, come to the okay. Ashtanga. I really enjoy it. So I went and then I, and I, it was just so fast and there was always jumping. And I, so I just sat, <laughs> but I knew the pot, like I knew that some of the postures were similar to what I would have been doing in the Hatha classes. So I just did the postures and I just refused to do any of the jumping at all. Um, mm. and you know what, but, mm. but there was a tapas element of it. It was quite tough. And, um, and there was that kind of tempo, which I kind of liked. Mm. Latterly I got mm. into it, but I suppose there's always this kind of, interplay or confu confusion in my mind still as to if someone had said to me at the time well you know if you don't do those jumps you know you can get out you know and this kind of mentality mm. you know like it, it's there mm. in the classes and there's there you know there are many teachers that you know mm. that i've heard you know that have this mentality you know that well yeah. my teacher was never really a mysore kind of teacher te you know he wasn't really on program with that you know latterly i did get very in program with the mysore stuff and you know, I went a bit down the rabbit hole there and became one of those teachers yeah, in the end, same, you know, for a while. Same, same. But um, <laughs> I didn't start that way. And, um, but I, there was a certain element of drive and the fact that it had some provident, uh, provenance, you know, that it came from, you know, the, the history and a certain yeah. tradition, yeah. whatever that means, that it wasn't just made up by someone at the time. But then I'm yeah. always kind of trying yeah. to understand that in, in the realm of the way I teach now, which is much more inclusive and, and it was, you know, much more, free and exploratory for an individual whilst keeping some sense of prescription in so it's not just another term of vinyasa again right i mean yeah how do we challenge yeah. ourselves enough to burn off some sense of uh, reticence in our own minds whilst maintaining an inclusivity because you talk a lot about just to bring it back to you again about the, like yeah. the softening i remember you talking on the conference that we had recently about soft spaces, soft, soft spaces which i really liked um so how do we do that, but maintain a sense of the, the the beauty of the Ashtanga, which is kind of challenging and is kind of prescriptive in in, in the best way possible? Because that you know that can be useful as well. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a shame to hear that people are kicking folks out if they're not doing X, Y, and Z. Yeah, um, absolutely. You hear that all the time. It, it is. It is. It is. I, I find that a, a shame. Uh, but uh, that has never been my experience, you know. I think uh, since, you know, I've been working so closely with Petri all these years. Your I've Petri's always never going to do that. <laughs> no. no, I mean, it's always been soft, soft spaces. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the fact that the, the Mysore class can accommodate the most driven, advanced practitioner to the person who's going to come in by the wall and do their chair sequence, like... The Mysore structure, under the uh, guidance of somebody who is just, you know, you know, able to see that 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 this practice is not one size fits all. And just since this podcast that you and Shana did is just so fresh in my mind, mm. you know, she spoke about the fact that somebody might just need, and it's also the, it's also happening in Mysore too. Like it's not like one size fits all in Mysore. I will say that like there is individualized um, instruction given from what I remember. Yeah. Um, so there's something that's lost in translation that makes it somehow that it has to be so rigid and so fixed and dogmatic and punitive punitive mm, is the word mm, mm, mm. um uh which is a shame because Mysore can accommodate anything and anyone and the fact that some people will just need a small short practice in order to be able to sit in comfortable steady posture and meditate and somebody might need to do fourth series and you know have the the the, the sweat and and the exercising of whatever is going on in order to reach that place of stillness and the fact that we humans we as part of nature we are such a diverse varied bunch uh of course not everybody is going to need the same thing out of their yoga practice and so it really speaks more to kind of like just what's going on with a teacher rather than about the yoga itself. 
And I just do want to return to this idea of, of, of punitive, right? Um, this is where the sort of the social aspect and the yoga come in, like the fact that we still live in a punitive justice world, like that's still a thing. Uh, there are efforts towards restorative justice, restorative justice meaning if right if 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 something happens between people between two people or between groups of people like some harm has been done uh you take steps in order to remedy this and return to right relationship but i would argue that we actually haven't had right relationship so there's no right relationship to turn to especially if we're talking about practicing yoga in the context of uh, patriarchy of um, white supremacy of capitalism of colonialism all these things that you touched upon um, with Shana right so we need to think about taking it a step further which is transformative justice which is about getting to the root the root of why there is um, harm happening like what is the cause of this and so that's sort of tangential but um i get a lot of hope um as i study more from people who are working within the field of transformative justice to see what are some elements that are in alignment already with um yoga philosophy because you know yoga philosophy in and of itself is already inherently trauma informed I know trauma informed is now a buzzword going around in yoga in yoga spaces, but it's not like the essence of of it is we're not adding anything new to the yoga. Right? I mean, car karma is another word for trauma. Store store trauma, isn't it? Really? There you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so. And, and I mean, you could look at it. You could look at all of this in like, uh, especially if we're looking at like. Uh, I was just rereading the Bhagavad Gita. If we're looking at the, the interplay of the gunas, like the sattva, rajas, tamas, you could even look at trauma through the, the interplay of those three energies that we're all constantly um, manifesting and co-creating and, 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 and going through. So it's very interesting. It's very, it's very, very interesting. And um, so I just do like to speak to the fact that trauma-informed yoga, it's not new. It's just that maybe there's just um, new terminology, maybe different um, science, uh, different research that's been done to just back up what has been known throughout the ages. Mm, mm. I suppose going back to something you said at the start of um, uh, this last um, conversation about the teacher and about allowing the Mysore room to, to, to uh, be a diverse room for different people holding space and yeah. um for different people's practices how does the teacher fit in because isn't the teacher the ultimate kind of pedagogue and kind of <laughs> a kind of patriarchal representative of the establishment here kind of suggesting that people do things a certain way or or, or how do you get <laughs> how do you get the most out of the student while still maintaining that you're something more than just a mate or are you just a mate, right? A friend, as we say in English, a mate. Because it is, I have a, a difficulty with this because at some place is, it, it is there in my heart for having been pushed a little bit in my sore, being pushed a little bit. I didn't, um, well, Patabi Joyce was too old when I met him to push anyone. But, um, you know, Shrat, he, he pushed me a little bit. And I, well, not in a bad way, to be quite honest with you. And I've been pushed a little bit by other male teachers generally. Not necessarily in a bad way, but I feel very uncertain in my own masculinity and uh, teacherliness to do that same thing because, yeah, I'm very aware that I'm fitting into a certain box of established mm. patriarchy and I just want to, yeah, w what are your feelings on that before I waffle on more? Yeah, that's a re <laughs> that's a really good question, Adam, and I just appreciate your sort of opening up and uh, what I read as sort of vulnerability when questioning um, your relationship to masculinity and mm, patriarchy. Mm, absolutely, um, yeah. I have been talking with different teachers who share similar identities to you, and one thing I've been suggesting is... Um, it's really about touching into the ways patriarchy harms you. Right. Right. So even though you benefit from it, 
And even though you have this gender privilege, what are the ways in which patriarchy has harmed you? And what are the ways in which patriarchy has kept you separate from uh, humanity? Um, what are the ways in which patri you, uh, patriarchy keeps you complicit in upholding um, systems of oppression and domination? And realizing that systems, when we are talking about systems of oppression and domination, that it 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 is enacted and it lives in the body. So it's totally like divine. I'm not talking about divine masculine energy, which is present in all bodies, right? I'm not talking about that because that is a, a, a beautiful, natural, needed part of, of, of nature and expression. But I'm talking about the ways in which um, uh, power and our relationships to power can be skewed and used to hurt yourself and others. Yeah. And so I don't know, like for me, like getting the most out of the student, I don't even know what that means because like it's uh, for me as a teacher, it's not about, I'm not there to get this, to have the student get the most out of them like that. What am I trying to extract from them? Like that, that to me, I'm like, it shows sort of a, a lack of, of, faith and trust in the practice and I, I i don't feel the need to get something out of anybody else i think this is the difficulty of this of the system is that it can be, it can be taken linearly is that there's a sequences there's these sequences that suggest that you're jumping over hoops to get to the next one which is harder than the last one right and you're making mm. progress and everyone nowadays wants to yeah. make progress and i suggest that progress in that linear manner is a mouse entry patriarchal idea and expression and is, i agree and, and i agree <laughs> and, and that I is agree. A, and that is somehow i'm not saying inherent in the ashtanga yoga practice in the way that it's formulated but it's definitely an easy shoe in you know to agreed put that. and it's a good way to bring students in and to like get a full workshop because it's something so tangible and it's, it's like tangible here, and like, you can measure your progress you can measure your progress let's in a visible do our way drills, let's do our backbending drills let's do our strength drills this is all stuff people are very ready to to pay and pay money and invest time into yeah and also not inherently bad therefore because you see no, it, it's tracks, it's it attracts you it attracted yeah. me because we're vested in this uh, ideas of visual progress, and uh, and it's a male centric idea that we, you know, that, that there's this ideal to be reached that we can do by our, you know, kind of brute force, and we have, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> right, and um, and I think it gets you into it. It got me into the yoga, and it kept me in it. But I think at a certain mm. point, at least this needs to be recognised, so this discourse can be expanded a little bit, and certainly as a teacher, mm. so. You can actually rest in the yoga position because the yoga position is a steady held position to experience mm. self in, you know, and if we're mm. always chasing forward mm. to, to something else, yeah. right? And um, because, you know, the patriarchal, what I consider as a man of the, and I, you know, equally as, uh, a, well, uh, let's say a, not inherently a stable idea of masculinity because I grew up in a very masculine environment feeling less than mm. masculine as, as in terms of the normative males that were around me by drinking yeah. pubs football yeah um, you know yeah. that that wasn't me so um yeah I, I think that it's to, to explore these ideas of how we approach the system and so it's perhaps you know less linear but keeps some kind of element of encouragement in that manner i don't know yeah, no, I mean, it's, 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 again, I just, I, I, I always return it back to how, how does toxic masculinity, how is it living through, through me? What are the ways in which I feel I need to control a situation, a certain outcome? What are the ways in which uh, a sense of um, needing to dominate and somehow like uh, bulldoze how is that being expressed in in my body and in unhealed aspects of 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 myself and so how can i tend to those how i've been doing it is through um i mean i have my um meditation practice i have ongoing self reflections 
Um, I need to do heal inner child work. Um, I need to heal my mother and father wound. So it's going back to a lot of like early and I, I had a I had a happy, loving family. Like this is and this is just speaking to somebody who who has felt loved in, in my early childhood years. And and still there's there's wounding from my from right. my early childhood because mm, mm. so not even speaking to folks who have experienced developmental trauma, right? Um, but it really is like going to how um, systems of oppression and domination are are mm, unhealed in me and therefore being expressed through me. Going to these softer spaces, it starts like first first within. It starts really within in your body, and uh, then. You know, it's been, and, and and now like my teaching has changed. Like I'm not teaching in a physical, physical location. I have my Patreon community. And so we work, uh, together, um, uh, via, via zoom. Um, and there I get to be very exploratory and I combine aspects of the Ashtanga with the more sort of trauma, slower trauma informed, um, approach. So I'm, I would say that I'm very much in an exploratory, uh, um, space in terms of my own practice and my own teaching. But I, I feel like, like, again, it's really the, the, the structure of the practice. It, it really feels like this container. It makes me feel safe knowing that there's this structure that you can go to. And it's like the notes of, you know, the music. No, I don't know what it's called, but it's the, like, you know, the music. The, mm. What is that called? The, the, the Staff? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. have that, and then yeah. you get to sort of create okay. your melody. Yeah, you've got a blank staff, and you can make the notes on it. But it's some you kind of structure within happen. within that. Then you can right. place the you notes the, within the that flats. structure. You have yeah, that's the nice. Flats. I like that. You have the flats. You have the... And so, like, I just, I don't want to be so quick to, like, let's just, like, you know, throw this structure out and all that, because that would be very destabilizing. But it I think really so. And yeah, just I mean, like, and that's what I think is good to recognize that we both got into it for that reason as well, that we had the structure and we had the, and I think, you know, there's masculine and feminine energy, obviously, and it's a generalized thing, but I mean, the masculine energy is about doing and achieving. And I think everyone has a bit of that, right? And the Ashtanga sequence lends itself nicely to that. But at a certain point, if you're not enabled to be in it as well and embraced as a, in, as the being part, not just the doing part of your, of your existence, then you're missing well, a trick and, with and you. Receiving, receiving and cultivating, which is sort of the more feminine side, this sort of every day you're co-creating with nature, with existence, with your practice. And so, you know, I've been hearing stories that people wake up and they go to the the their the Mysore class and they're already thinking about Kapotasana and they start to have like anxiety and panic attacks around Kapotasana. And that that feels that's so sad somehow because um why to increase the suffering that's already inherent in life especially when you're going to like yoga, which is sort of the antidote to that. So it makes me feel sad when I hear people are like, oh my God, Kapotasana, oh my God, like, ah, like it's such a, uh, brings up so much, it's triggering um, and not in a good way, but, you know, in a way that is is causing a lot of like unnecessary suffering. Um that does make me feel a little bit sad. And that will, I, you know, I'm just wondering, like, how is it going to be? You know, we're, we're all, like, not getting younger. Like, how is the practice going to look like in 20 years for us? You know, um, how are we going to be, like, and again, like, hopefully the idea is that new people can come, young people can come, people who want that rigor and the tapas and need it, right? Um, but I think just we have to expand, like, look at yoga, like, through all, uh, for all seasons of life, if you know what I mean. Mm. And hopefully our my, my so hopefully our Mysore classes can reflect that and make it be like there can be, you know, my mom, she started Ashtanga Yoga at 69. Um, 
she's she's a very for her the practice she resonates with it like she's she she likes structure she's okay with discipline she's okay with doing the same thing but even her practice has shifted in these years that she's been practicing like forward bending it's not so good for her so she's working a lot more with the therapeutic second series stuff but she's still doing the practice and it's beautiful to witness like how's a karundavasana yeah um, yeah. <laughs> um, next Ma- next time. Yeah. Next lifetime. <laughs> Mum, if you're listening, there you go. There's still hope. I'll teach you. I'll come around. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? Yeah. Um, I think it's difficult though because trauma, in a, it's all about the dose. Maybe in a, in terms of you can definitely in approaching something like Kapitasana or Kurundavas, and we have these points and they're triggered, and there is a, a, a um a kind of as you mentioned earlier, this exercisation that can come out through locating. And I felt that through doing those postures, there's this free flow, let's say it's a disassociated fear or it's flea floating. And then you're going to pin it to a certain point and make it real. And then you can kind of re-embrace it and kind of, you know, and kind of purge that kind of trauma out of the body. But on the other hand, depending on the dose, you can eat equally increase the trauma in the body right i mean you know your yoga right. can further yeah. increase the trauma in your your nervous system as well you yeah I mean? no that's you, a really yeah. good that's a really good metaphor adam about about the dosage absolutely yeah yep 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 and i think there's a very fine line between uh, mm. medicine and poison mm. Mm. ashtanga yoga is strong medicine as it is and so um, it does require just then skillful uh, administering of the right mm. dose. Mm. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. I think finally, what what are your thoughts on people saying that it's a, about the uh, the appropriation aspect of the yoga? It's another form of colonialism. And take I know you have a couple of ideas to say on that. So maybe you might finalize this chat by talking a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I I speak as a non-South Asian practitioner and teacher, so it's something that I try to be mindful towards. Um, I think there's a lot of ongoing harm uh, being done. Um, the fact that we are not able to resolve the harm that has been done, you know, in terms of colonization and and the fact that there's this collective, um, and uh, not anesthesia, what's the word, the collective, uh, when you lose memory, what's that called? Uh, amnesia. Yeah. Amnesia. Yeah, yeah. Right. Anesthesia. So well, this, it could be, is... I think maybe yeah, also <laughs> anesthesia. <laughs> there's could a selective, be. there's could also, se- there's also selective, uh, a purposeful repression and forgetting, isn't there? Totally, because it, yeah, totally. Because it, it yeah. works for some people. You know? Yeah. Look at every European city. Right. No, and so I think, like, we uh, we really do need to be cognizant to, to the fact that, the, that this is something that um, is very much alive in the modern Western yoga industrial complex, as it is known um, sometimes. I think Shane also... Um, there's also a Buddhist industrial complex, by the way, that I've heard different Buddhist teachers speak to. Um, so yes, there is there is this element of um, uh, power and privilege and taking uh, ideas that are not uh, indigent to one's own culture and then passing them off of, as your own. And this is this is very very uh, alive and problematic and. Um, leaves people who are of that culture uh, can leave them out since they don't have the same sort of, let's say, like if we're just talking about privilege in terms of race, they don't have the same white privilege, they might not have the same access. And so there's a lot of pain, right? When you're like, hey, but this is my thing. And now I can't speak to it. I can't teach it. And this person is going to be labeled the expert. So I, I like to center South Asian voices. I like to learn from um, a wide range of South Asian teachers when when I can um, and really just uh, uh, try to um, 
not be complicit in, you know, just, okay, so what's the like number one yoga book on Amazon? And it's written Mm. by like a white Western man. And again, Mm. there's nothing like inherently wrong with that, but Mm. it's just that like who has the, the, uh, let's say, um, who, who's sort of like just more visible and who has, who's deemed a, an expert to speak on these, these topics. Um, it's a, it's a tricky one. It's a tricky one and there's no clear blueprint. Um, but for sure, centering South Asian voices. I think also it's acknowledgement is simply acknowledging where it's come from, even if Acknowledging Even, and also act like making action steps to make sure that we're centering and investing and learning from. So acknowledgement is the first step, but we can't just stop there. Um, and so, and 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 what kind of real mutual relationships of trust and um, what relationships are we having with folks from? from the culture. That's also very important. So being able to cultivate, be it work relationships, be it friend relationships, really being in dialogue with with, with folks, uh, it's important and not just like kind of like a token thing. Mm-hmm. But um, that's very important to me. So I, 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 I do, I, I try to cultivate these relationships. It often strikes me like, there's nothing inherently wrong, say, like you're a mid-Western white woman in the US and you're teaching yoga and, you know, and you haven't acknowledged the background and, you you know, you have, you're have you teaching yoga asana, you know, you call, but it's the problem with what it's, a lot of it's the problem with terminology and what you're, you know, what you're calling it, right? Like if we're just teaching exercise, you know, and it happens to be yoga postures, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But if you're going around namasteing people and, you know, wearing mala beads and then, you know, calling it yoga and saying you're doing something, then... I suppose there's an obligation and a responsibility to, to search out and have some understanding of the origin of what you're doing, right? Otherwise, you could say, well, everything everything is touched by transformation, right? Like, mm-hmm. I often think, I uh, use the idea of uh, foods as well, right? Like, you know, there's a background to certain foods and then they reach different cultural diasporas and they're transformed and, you know. What, what is authentic? Yeah, that's a good. I love that. Ah, know, that's, that's a, a really good point. Yeah. That's a really yeah. good point. And things that the, the, the fact that things are in relationality and they always have been. And if we look, I mean, even if you look at a Buddhism, uh, when yeah. Buddhism moved to Tibet, mm. like mm. there, there were indigenous practices. I think it was China, called Bon, Tibet, right? Japan. Right. And Thailand, so, like, the Buddhist Burma. teachings merged with what was already existing and created this thing that's called Tibetan Buddhism. Same thing if you look, like you said, uh, China and Zen. I just heard a new book, which is about the shamanistic roots of Zen. So here came Zen and Zen Buddhism dominated already existing indigenous practices. So it's really important to remember that things have been in relationality since forever. Mm. (laughs) Like it's just, it's always been that relationality and ideas mixing and merging and then creating something that is uh, um, kind of uh, uh, makes sense in this context and it's very yeah the idea of authenticity it's a very interesting one um, when we, we are talking about yoga and what's considered authentic in South Asia versus well what is it that some one in New York City might need, right? So it's it's an interesting it's an interesting question that is just co- continually being be, being played out and co created in this ongoing relationality. Um, I would just encourage, like uh, you know, we need to understand our own identities and our own context and where we're coming from because that doesn't mean something. It's nobody's fault for being born the way you were. Like, that's mm, not what mm. this is about. But yeah. it is all our responsibility to know what it means to sort of walk in the identities you walk with and then do what you can to um, kind of make make things better for, for all of us, really. And I really like this quote here when we're talking about, I'll just share it with you because it, 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 uh, what is it here when we're talking about? So this is a quote written by or spoken by an indigenous Australian artist. Her name is Leela Watson. 
And she says, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your but if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Our liberty is bound together. So that gives me a lot of inspiration because it's not like, you know, it's it's kind of gonna be all of us or none of us in this in this thing <laughs> of collective liberation. Um, it's going to be all of us or none of us in terms of species, the survival of the species on the planet. And granted, like depending on what kind of resources you have, some people might have more protective measures around them than others, but it literally is going to be all of us or none of us in terms of, uh, at least the way I see it, how we're going to survive and go forward as a species. Remembering that we are all nature, remembering that we all belong together inherently, and um, trying to to reclaim that. Yeah, that's a maybe a good place to to finish our interview. Um, what what uh, what inspires you, Wambu? What um, just to finish it off, what, what in figures or pe or books or people? Can you give any kind of ins inspiration? Or, or reading that you would uh, uh, you would recommend to people. Uh, I'm really inspired by a lot of uh, what's being written and spoken about by Black Buddhist teachers in the West. So people like Lama Rod Owens, Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams, Doctor Larry Ward. Um, I'm really very much inspired by their commitment to liberation for all folks, as well as just being extremely cognizant um, of the ways in which um, suffering shows up and what we can do about that. What inspires me, just the, you know, the quest for freedom, freedom over happiness inspires me. The fact that humans, we, we fail and we falter and we get up and we try again and we do the same. That inspires me. <laughs> yeah, so those are just some things that inspire me. I just want to say that we have a, before one of podcast, we also have an Indigenous thinker called Tyson Yanka Porter, who is a very interesting one, Indigenous voices as well. And uh, to finish mm. off, Wambu, just on a lighter note, what, what um, I have to yeah. say is, well, give, give, give me a guilty <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> A guilty pleasure. Um, yeah, I love binge watching Netflix. I love binge watching Netflix shows. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. I'm currently on a, a Korean series, like okay. Korean drama. Like, wow. Korean so drama. that's kind of my guilty pleasure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Period yeah. pieces and modern pieces. I'm just really vibing with 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 the right. culture coming from there right now. Right. Yeah. That's that's a yeah. That's we've had that before. In fact, um, yeah. It's one of my one of my guilty pleasures as well. So um, is it? Oh, Netflix. Well, a little, yeah. Um, some of the shows, <laughs> like I, I often say, like um, you know, um, me and Mark Roberts are like a chick flick. Sometimes you know, I'm, I like. Oh, the, that's um, awesome. The, I like the <laughs> Emily in Paris. One of my favorite Netflix. Um, nice. Yeah, that's um, sweet. <laughs> well, thanks for coming on and um, sharing that perspective and um, yeah. Really appreciate having you here. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate you inviting me. Thank you so much. It's been nice to talk with you. Mm -hmm.